Joshua Ashley is uh, one of our advisory board members as well, and uh, work for Linklaters based in the US. And she has very kindly agreed to give us a, a perspective and an overview of um, what's happening in the US with regards to blockchain and, uh, and digital assets, what are the main developments and uh, what we can learn the other countries from the US. So <clears throat> Joshua, I, I hope you are unmuted uh, and over to you. Thank you. Hi, thank you so much. And can you guys all hear me now? Yes, this is my perfect. First using the platform. Okay, great. Yes, perfect. Um, thank, you. thank you for having me. So a little bit about the US um, in 12 minutes or less. Uh, I think the best way to think about the approach in the US just from a, a macro level with respect to blockchain and digital assets is somewhat similar to the way the US has begun looking at tech in general and other forms of tech, including AI um, and you know other, other uh, cutting edge technologies, which is through a national security lens. And I think if you do that, it begins to explain some of the many uh, somewhat puzzling at times steps that we've seen taken. So why do I say this? If, if you think of things through a national security lens, then you see tech potentially as both a race to the moon and an arms race. And for certain technologies, a talent war. Now within the digital asset space, I think we, unfortunately in the US, many, many in the administration, and many regulators um, and some legislators, they do not yet see digital assets as a talent war in the US. I think that will come as, you know, we have increasingly seen institutional adoption and just, you know, continued growth and building within the industry um, to become a multi-trillion dollar industry. But I think what is focused on right now a lot is you know, the, the arms race form. And why do I say that? Well, if you look at a lot of what is done and a lot of the federal and state legislation through that lens, you can see that a lot is focused on things like anti-money laundering, you know, the prevention of terrorist financing, things like that, where you may say, why was this decision made? And you look at it and you're saying, ah, oh, you know, what they're concerned about could value be going into the hands of potential hostile actors? Or could this be being, could this technology be being used for purposes like that? Now, as we've seen from you know, data from Chainalysis and Elliptic and other sorts of data providers, you know, that narrative doesn't, doesn't really hold true um, in terms of the actual, as, as far as I know, as far as I've seen, the actual number of transactions or amount of transactions, but some of the, the large, you know, incidents, including as, as you may be familiar with tornado cash and things like that, you know, that captures the attention of governments, um, including the US, right? And, you know, involving hostile state actors in that instance. And it causes, you know, US regulators and legislators to try and use tools in their arsenal that may have been used for other purposes. So I'm, I'm just touching upon Tornado Cash for a moment, because as you as you may know, you know, there was significant litigation about the sanctions that were applied in connection with Tornado Cash, with many saying, look, this is not a person, this being Tornado Cash, this is not not property. This is not an organization. These are smart contracts. Um, and you know, Treasury was successful in its bid to to sanction uh, Tornado Cash. However, thereafter, FinCEN, you know, uh, the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, used a very seldom used power under the USA Patriot Act from a long time ago. You know, shortly after uh, September 11th. Uh, so you know, that was 23 years ago, right? And they used this power, this 311 power, 
to say, you know what, we're going to designate all virtual currency mixers of of heightened as of height as being of heightened um, money laundering concern, right? An entire type of of smart contract, an entire uh, you know type of of program, and so. So I think we will begin to see more and more of this um, on one hand. I'll get to the other stuff in a moment. But I, I say this because you know many people are unaware or, or not as aware as they perhaps could be of some Commerce Department proposed rules that would also apply KYC AML obligations to infrastructure as a service providers. And why does this matter? Well, because a lot of the arguments in the U.S. with respect to things like KYC, AML, and the like, they focus on whether there's money transmission, right? Or whether, you know, there are BSA, so Bank Secrecy Act obligations, um, whether at the federal or state level, you know, and the equivalents. And if infrastructure as a service, you know, should that require KYC, AML, you can think of a lot of projects where they've taken the position, we're not doing money transmission, we're just infrastructure. So I think this is an important thing to watch because I think many with many projects you know, they're not sufficiently focused on on things like KYC AML and those regulators within the US because regulators like the SEC and the CFTC um, you know take up a lot of space right in the news and in their enforcement but as we often say to clients you know for certain securities law, violations, you know, yes, you should not be doing them. They, they, you know, you should comply with securities laws, but you know what, if you don't comply with, but absent fraud, you know, you're, you're probably, you're probably not going to jail in many of those instances. Now, in the case of failures to comply with KYC, AML, things like that, you know, it's quite possible you're going to jail. So I think this is something that from a U.S. perspective, we need to reframe a bit so that projects are focused on this. I think this comes up in a variety of spaces, including um, DeFi, many, many, many types of businesses. But moving over to just the, the US structure for a minute, as many, if not all of you know, we have, we have overlapping regulators. We do not have a single regulator that's focused on digital assets. We ha essentially have nearly all regulators, it seems, focused on digital assets and potentially having jurisdiction. This is both at the federal level and then at the 50 state and DC individual level, right? So you may have requirements, for example, as I mentioned, to register with FinCEN, but then you also, if you're operating in New York or have New York customers or are doing business in New York, virtual currency business, you're gonna have to worry about the bit license potentially and so on for different states. And those state laws are not necessarily consistent with one another and questions such as which you know wh what is a digital asset transaction classified as you know we often are in a debate it seems between saying okay this token is a commodity right and is there is there a security and people frame it as an either or but the thing is there could be both right without taking the regulators view for a it's just important to remember that the CFTC used nearly every digital asset as a commodity. And it also takes the position that, yes, in some instances, that commodity can be subject to the U.S. securities laws. It's not either or. It's a different test. So some people may say, well, what about NFTs? They can't be commodities, right? They're, they could be a one of a one. But the CFTC takes the position that even art is a commodity. So a lot of these things, I think, as we as we just pull back for a moment and you see the overlapping jurisdiction, um, as, as you likely know, a lot of this is being fought out in the courts as we speak. Uh, there are very large cases against trading platforms and, and all manner of different market participants, um, chiefly led, although not entirely led, by folks like the staff of the SEC. And as, as you as you may know, there have been differing decisions thus far in the various courts. The thing is, these are at the district court level. So what that means in the U.S. system is that district court judges don't have to follow 
the decisions or the reasoning of other district court judges, even in their same district. So we are, we are slowly, we are slowly determining what the law is in the courts. At the same time, as, as many of you may know, we have an election that's coming up and the candidates have, have espoused different types of positions. It's, we're yet to know fully what, what Kamala Harris's position will be insofar as we don't know to what extent it may differ from current President Biden's position with respect to digital assets. And certainly President Biden has given us uh, Gary Gensler as the chair of the SEC and, and a veto of the proposed repeal of the accounting guidance, SAB 121, right? So we are not sure. Uh, there may be a difference if Kamala Harris wins, uh, but we don't yet know. And on the other side, we have former President Trump who has vowed when he was speaking in Nashville at the Bitcoin conference to make the U.S. the crypto capital of the world, or, sorry, of the planet. Um, so very big, big, bold statements. Um, I think this is going to be an election to watch in, in terms of a lot of things, but also digital assets. And I think, you know, although I have painted a rather bleak picture in many respects, we do have legislation that has been, you know, moving along at the federal level. And that some believe, including sitting senators, um, that perhaps in the lame duck session, so after Congress ends, before the new Congress people come in, maybe we will still have the opportunity to have, for the first time, uh, you know, some sort of market structure regulation uh, at a federal level for digital assets. Um, and what I'm referring to potentially would be things like the Fit 21 Act or um, some, some developments based on that. So that's, uh, I think I have one minute left and uh, I hesitate to go into any things specific further because there's just not enough time but i hope that this has provided a, a pretty good overview of what the outlook looks like from here yes thank you very much uh joshua that was that was excellent i think you did very well um a couple of questions if we can ask they've been sent to us um from our members of the forum um very basic questions and i i, I suppose there have been a point of quite extensive debates <clears throat> recently uh, in the recent past around the, the first one is the different U.S. states are, my understanding is that they are allowed to make their own um, kind of, like Wyoming has a, a crypto law or something like that. So how does this harmonize with the national level policy making? I mean, how much? autonomy does this uh, different states have to make their own policies and laws and then, then you have a national u.s policy as well so how does that work in u.s so it's a great question the states have a lot of latitude um right there are some things where there is federal preemption right supposedly and i say supposedly um with a bit of a, a smile you know things like security laws, you know, there is generally intended to be federal preemption, but Wyoming is a great example of how states can come up with their own differing positions. So just to, to delve into that a little bit further, it's actually a really interesting story. Um, as the Wyoming law was being developed, my understanding just from back at that time was that many in Wyoming kept waiting for waiting for the call that never came from someone in the federal government to say, don't do that, right? Or, or to try to stop them from passing uh, the laws uh, regarding specifically digital assets and their classification. And that's for you know, consumptive you know, digital assets that are intended for consumptive use, right? And why was Wyoming able to take that position? potentially, although I'm not a Wyoming scholar, my understanding is that while the SEC was viewing digital asset transactions as potentially involving securities, being securities transactions, uh, Wyoming took the position that digital assets were property. And property has long been the purview of 
the states. So they took a different, a different position about what the very thing or the very transactions in the thing was. So yes, um, there are many instances in which the states don't necessarily harmonize with national policy making. Um, another example that I can give just from outside of our industry, but of course it's an adjacent and sometimes overlapping industry, which is AI, is you may see that there are incredible, uh, there's incredible contention going on right now about some AI bills that have passed the California legislature, um, including one called SB 1047, where folks in the US government, uh, including you know, Nancy Pelosi and many other prominent names have been discouraging uh, California from moving ahead with this and trying to convince Governor Gavin Newsom not to sign um, the bills into, into law. And we have also seen many from industry uh, up in arms about those types of bills. Now there's a question, right? Will the states take the lead? It's just staying with AI for a second. Will the states take the lead in the same way that they did with respect to, for example, privacy in the US? And there's a real tension there. So I think, um, yeah, there's, there's not necessarily a harmonization. Sure. Thank you. Uh, and one last question before we take Peter questions is around the, uh, this has been again a big heated debate recently, um, and not recently, I mean, it's been going on for some time, is the SEC's remit. I mean, people have been saying that they're uh, enforcing things uh, beyond their remit. They are not policymakers. We have seen all the legal battles with Ripple and others and Ethereum, and it's a, it's a security it's not a security and all that so in the uk for example we have fca but fca do not make laws they do not make policy they are not legislators they are regulators so any bill anything uh, 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 any policy has to be obviously approved by the by the parliament the members of parliament the house of lords and the king and then it becomes a bill uh, and, and then an act so this these um and then Donald Trump said, I'm going to fire Gary Gensler on day one. Uh, how much powers a single person has? I mean, in terms of the person who's in charge of SEC, can they make new laws? Or are they just there to make sure that the laws made by the US um, Congress or, or Parliament are, are implemented? I mean, what's the remit like? So without knowing all the ins and outs of the role, I will say Gary Gensler as chair of the SEC is also one of the five commissioners. So to the extent that there are major decisions about whether to go forward with an enforcement action or whether to propose a new rule or things like that, you know, he's one of the five votes. And he also obviously is the head of the organization and wields a lot of power and influence. Plus he's a long time Washington um, insider right, who, who has served in prior administrations and, um, you know, when he was at the CFTC, the CFTC gained a great deal of power and jurisdiction, right, and it appears that he's been trying to do the same with the SEC um, while he's there. You know, many believe, although who knows, that he has had designs, I don't know if he currently does or if he in fact did, had designs on being the head of Treasury in the U.S. So, very, um, very bold, very uh, strong views. And my understanding is that, you know, it is a very top down SEC at this point, and that his approach is, is quite different from his predecessor, Jay Clayton. Of course, even Jay Clayton left us with the Ripple case on his last day in office. Um, but, but I will say, um, with respect to the SEC's role, they have enforcement power as part of what they're supposed to be doing. They're also supposed to be promoting capital formation and, you know, and the orderly markets. And they have a rulemaking power as well. So in the past, in past years in the US, many criticized the SEC for not exercising its um, rulemaking powers to make clear rules, right? We've even seen lawsuits against the SEC in respect of that. What has happened more recently is that the SEC has proposed rules. However, the rules have not been, um, been the proposed rules have not uh, been found to be very favorable by those in the industry. So we've seen, you know, the potential 
uh, the proposal to expand the definition of exchange, which would uh, capture aspects of DeFi. We've seen other rules that would require safekeeping of a wider variety of, of assets by um, you know, investment advisors, including those that may not be securities, things like that. Uh, accounting guidance, uh, including SAB 121 that has been um, unpopular with everyone from financial institutions to you know, crypto native companies and those in Congress. And what I would say is we're at a really interesting time because you know there are a number of enforcement actions out there, right? And the courts are fine. CC has made allegations and said this is what this is how things are, and now it's up to the courts, which are really the the arbiter of determining what the law is. At the same time, we recently had the death knell um, sounded for. Chevron deference, which that is the principle, uh, basically that you know that there is a deference to regulators when they interpret their own statutes that that um, that Congress gave them the power, right? The the scope of what their mandate date is. There used to be deference given to the to the regulator to say, hey, yes, you know, this is the regulator says that it has jurisdiction over. Now, we recently had cases that struck that down. So there is, that is no more. And so that may hamper um, the SEC and other regulators' abilities to pass rules that go beyond the letter of their, their jurisdictional grant. By Thank you very much. Yes, that's very helpful. That's, I see. That's that's very clear. Thank you very much, Joshua. Uh, Joshua joined us from the U.S. I uh, had to wake up very early in the morning, 6 a.m. So thank you very much, um, Joshua, for your excellent um, talk and contributions.